Good morning, real life. Happy Palm Sunday. Thank you for being here this morning. Let's get started as we call our friends together. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's all stand and proclaim it. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. Go ahead and have a seat. We are really glad you're here today. I'm Christy Jacobs. I'm married to Jean, the senior pastor, and... I'm Amy, and I am the next-gen coach here. I feel like we're getting to become, like, besties or something because we've done this a lot now together, and yesterday we did a conference, a TechWise conference here. Uh, amazing. We had 16 teenagers that gave up their Saturday to come and learn about social media and the things to do and not to do. So great day. Thank you if you were here yesterday and if you served, we appreciate you. Okay, so there's this thing that we used to do in our other church, John Cook and I, and we had a little competition about jokes. So I have a joke for you today. You ready? Yeah. 
Actually, I was going to ask Amy, but you guys can all join in. Okay. I'm really bad at jokes. What's the best type of jewelry to gift on Easter? I have no clue. 14 karat gold necklace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> okay. The gauntlet has been thrown now, John Cook. If you're watching online. <laughs> I'm like, John's not here yeah. today. Bring it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome online, too. We're glad you're joining us this morning. So Amy's going to tell you a little bit about what's coming up for Easter. Yeah, so we have Easter extravaganza coming up. And this weekend, I put a bulletin insert that has way more information than I'm going to be able to share on the stage. But the thing that I really want to let you guys know is we need volunteers. Lots of volunteers. I think I have five people signed up for this event, and we typically have about 500 people show up. So I to need... To, not yeah. to volunteer, but to participate. Yeah, to yeah. participate. So we need volunteers to come hang out, love on the people in our community, help put out eggs, help clean up, because um, it goes... Our last egg hunt is at 8 o'clock at night, and then we have sunrise service at 7 a.m., so everything needs, the church needs to look really good. So I need help just cleaning up. So if you can't come until after the egg hunt and you just want to come and help clean up, please show up to help. Um, we also have a egg stuffing serve night on Thursday at 6 p.m. here at the church. And you guys can come help with that. So if you have kids, this is a great opportunity. Bring them, have them help stuff eggs and have them serve alongside you. Yes, also, when you came in this morning, you got a bulletin packet. There's an orange card inside. We just ask you to fill it out. It's your first time here. Let us know. Uh, one of our pastors would love to call you, just welcome you, kind of let you know what's going on in the church. And then the rest of everything that is going on in the church is on the front page of that. So we, I don't know how many times, honestly, I've had people go like, oh, I didn't know we were doing that. I'm like, oh, gosh, it's on your bulletin. It's on our web page. It's on Facebook. So it's on the event wall. Yeah, it's on the event wall. So, yeah, so there's, uh, you, there's really no excuse not to know what's going on in the church. So <laughs> there you go. All right. Are you guys ready to worship God this morning? I am so ready. I need it. I, I drove five blocks and I'm wiped out already. <laughs> I need to worship. Let's pray and then we'll get into God's word in the song. Jesus, we praise you today. We thank you so much for who you are. You are a great and mighty God. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our church and through the people that are here today. Thank you yesterday for who you brought to share uh, some of the horrid stuff that's going on in our world, God. And I pray that we would be your hands and feet today. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what we're going to celebrate in the next two weeks, Palm Sunday today, and then next week, Good Friday and Easter. And oh my goodness, we're so grateful for what you did for us. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. And we give all this in your name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Al. <laughs> up the name of Jesus and praise him. Go ahead and stand up. Two, three, four. <laughs>
Thank you, worship team. Good morning. Please be seated. How are you? Hi, Real Life Kids. How are you guys? Are you good? All right. Man, I love having them come out and worship with us on Sunday morning and Friday night. If you're new with us, I'm Gene. Get to be uh, the lead pastor here. Um, got a couple things to talk about this morning. And as Mike left, I'm going to ask him to come back up here. I'm going to give you some news this morning, and is Dave Renner, Dave, Dave's here. So if you came to our men's breakfast last month, you found out that we've got a little bit of a changing of the guard in regard to men's ministry here at Real Life. Dave Renner um, has been leading men's ministry for about four years, and he's been doing an amazing job, and if you've been at our men's breakfast, you've seen that grow every month. It's been awesome. And he is stepping over to be involved with something else. We're kicking off a ministry. We're, we're calling it Helping Hands, where he's going to be trying to more intentionally do service projects in the community in the name of Jesus to show people the practical love of Jesus. And, uh, and then Mike, uh, Mike Wright, who he and his wife Loretta have been leading a small group here since the beginning, pretty much, of our church. He's stepping into men's ministry and uh, so, so guys, next Saturday at 8 a.m., we'd love for you to come to the men's breakfast and kind of hear a little bit more of the vision for where men's ministry is going to continue to go, and then we'll let you mo know more information about what's happening with Helping Hands in these next weeks and months as that develops, right? Is that good? Just wanted you to know, church, what's happening, so thanks, you guys. Super encouraged by that. It's been a uh, a pretty amazing week here at Real Life. Uh, I think Christy and Amy mentioned the tech conference yesterday uh, that happened, and that was really cool to watch. Um, it was kind of interesting to watch parents get their hair blown back a little bit um, about tech, but the cool thing about it is, is anyone feel a little overwhelmed by how fast tech is developing? Um, it was really good for parents to get uh, some hope and some tools to learn about how to navigate that with their family. So I was really encouraged by the team that did that. And Chris and Sarah Shirt from Real Life Post Falls came over to do some of the presentations. So that was good to be part of the bigger family to see that happen. And then I had, uh, I've told you about a couple of churches down in Oregon that we get to work with. Um, we get to coach their pastors in this idea of relational discipleship. And so Brent and Kathy Murphy who lead a church down in Cresswell, Oregon, spent the week with us. He's the lead pastor and his wife. And it was really good. We drug him around to small groups. They, he came to men's, uh, men's breakfast, we ha or, uh, men's group. We had him out in the backfield picking up sticks in the name of Jesus. Um, she came to the women's luncheon. They went to home groups, came to church last weekend. They went to the um, sharing your faith class that Rhonda Kitchen is teaching during the 11 a.m. service, by the way. There is still room in that class if you would like to uh, plug yourself in. And it was just really, really good um, for me because I was looking at the church with a little bit different eyes, trying to see the church through the lens of his eyes. And I got to tell you, church, you guys are amazing. It was so good to hear um, their feedback on what they saw here. Um, and it was good for me to be able to tell them, I don't know that, I don't think, I mean, I think God likes our church an awful lot, but I don't think he likes our church any more than churches in Oregon. Do you? Right? God is building his church, right? And so it was good to be able to give him some hope about um, the God, the same people that are in this church are in his church down there. And then, and then just to encourage him and help him to see where God's working in his church um, the, the, but I got to tell you, one of the things that he, that he and his wife talked about over and over again, and I'm just, I'm just, I, I just got to tell you, I'm so proud of the men in this church. Um, I, and I love the women in this church, so I mean, don't think that I'm that weird guy. But for men in the church to step up and be the men that they've been called to be and lead um, and, and to watch and hear the conversations from some of the wives in our church that, that his wife got to talk to and he talked to, they talked to as a couple, where they talked about the fact that my husband's actually engaged in his relationship with Christ. I mean, it's amazing to hear those stories. I, I love to see what God's doing because I think that 
as we read through Scripture, we see God call men and he gives them a responsibility and a, uh, to, to, to love him and, and lead their families. And I love seeing that happen here. Um, I, love, um, I love hearing the stories of wives that have prayed for the husbands for 35 years and then their husbands come to know Christ. You know, I mean, it's, it's good to see what God does there. And um, so, so that happened this week. Last week, uh, this last week, we've had a couple baptisms in our church. So we love to try to show you that so we can celebrate together if you weren't there. So we've got a couple pictures of the first baptism. This is Corey Reed getting baptized in the Ferguson's Holy Hot Tub. So um, uh, pretty cool to see that. And then a guy named Casey Freeman got baptized during their 11 a.m. service last week. And he actually goes to Real Life Ministries Spokane Valley, but this is his hometown. So he wanted to get baptized in his hometown with his family, and I think that video is next. So Casey, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? With all my heart. With all my heart. That's awesome. And have you received him as your Savior and committed to following him as your Lord? Absolutely. Forever and always. Okay. And are you committing today to lead your wife and son uh, towards Jesus as, as, as you follow Jesus? I am. That's pretty cool. You ready? Yes, sir. Okay. You want to plug your nose? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? It's your cousin, right? Okay. Casey, because of your confession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, rise to walk a new life. <laughs> I just hope we never grow tired of watching God work like that, right? You know, I, I tell people all the time, I think when a heart is changed by Jesus, it's, almost, it's a bigger miracle than this Red Sea parting because water will go where you tell it to go, right? But the heart's deceitful. And so there's this amazing thing that God does when he changes a life. And it just encourages me so much because of his family and his friends how one changed life affects other change, you know, affects other lives for the glory of Jesus. So, and then last weekend I preached with Matthew Ferguson, those of you were, that were here. Didn't he do a good job? Yeah, he did amazing. This week he's been approaching me, Pastor Gene, when do I get to do it again? I said, well, it's going to be a day or two, but, um, but I'm so, he was so good at what God's putting in him, so... And then I get to follow my wife up here. She did welcome. Isn't she cute? Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get after it this morning. You guys ready? We're going to get in the Word of God this morning. Um, so we're taking a pause from Philippians, if you've been with us for the last number of weeks. And today we're going we're gonna to take a pause for the next two weeks to talk about the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we celebrate Easter. And, and this, is, this is kind of a challenging time for the church, which it shouldn't be because it's the greatest story in the world. But sometimes it's challenging because some people are brand new to the Bible and they're like, this seems too good to be true. And then some of us have been around the, the, the Scripture for a long time and we've heard the story and over and over again and sometimes it's hard to stay engaged. Right? Some of you right now are like, okay, great. We're going to talk about the triumphal entry. Great time for a nap. Um, so here's the thing that I, I just want to encourage you in is, is to, to we're going to pray here in just a moment I'm going to pray that God will help me get through my nerves and that his word will be communicated clearly but as important is that we pray that our hearts stay engaged because it's really an amazing story that God would leave heaven and come to earth on a rescue mission to rescue his enemies it's a great story here's the other thing I'd like to ask you to do this week is grab one of the Gospels, and, and probably one of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and read it. Read the whole book of one of the Gospels. I, and I know some of you are new to the Bible, and, and we've got Bibles out at the connecting point if you don't have one at home, or you can put it on your phone. And I know for some of you, you've never read a whole book of the Bible, and you're like, man, there's a lot of words there. Um, and, and, there, and, and then I get kind of hung up because there's some concepts there I don't understand. And I, I just want to let you know there are concepts there that I don't understand. I've been reading it a while. 
But there's something special when you hear the story of Jesus um, as you read through the whole gospel, that it helps um, when you get to his death, burial, and resurrection. It really, what, what, what happens, what you'll see, and especially if you, for guys, I always recommend they read the book of Mark if they haven't read a, a gospel because it's pretty fast moving. And what happens is, is you get to, as you're reading through the book of Mark, you get to the section that we're going to talk about today, the triumphal entry where Jesus enters Jerusalem the last week of his life. And the story is like, Jesus is going here and he's doing this and he calls these guys and he heals this person. And then he gets to the last week and it slows way down. And that last week, you know, I, I've heard it said that um, if you're going to go on a trip and you know you're not going to come back from that trip, the people around you, you're going to probably tell them the most important things that last week those last few minutes and that last conversation. And I think we see that with Jesus. The last week of his life, there is so much good, deep teaching about the kingdom of heaven and about who God is and who we are in relation to him. So I just want to encourage you to read um, one of the gospels this week. I'm preaching out of Matthew this morning. Um, but we're, we're going to kind of cruise through some of the Old Testament um, and then next week during our services on Friday night, we have, uh, it'll look a little bit different where Friday night's our Good Friday service, where we're really going to focus on Jesus in the garden and Jesus on the cross. And it's going to look a little different than Sunday morning when we're going to focus on the resurrection. So if you're able to come to both, it'd be great. You can get a, a more full picture of what the story looks like uh, and why we celebrate Easter. But we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 21. So I'd love it if you'd turn in your Bibles and Bible apps there. So let's ask God to, uh, to bless our time together this morning. Father God, we thank you. The story of the gospel is good. It's better than good. It's amazing. And it changes all of eternity. And so, Lord, this morning I pray that, that I would speak clearly. I pray, God, that the word would be received with power by each of us. We are desperate to hear from you, Jesus. We're desperate to know who you are. It's hard for us in our human minds to understand how good you are and how perfect you are, and how powerful you are. But I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal yourself to us in a, in a, in a deeper way this morning. I pray for those this morning that are here that are wondering if, if, you, if you see them, if you know them, if they can trust you. I pray, God, that you would reveal yourself that, and you would, you would show them that, they, they, you, that you see everything and, and you see them specifically and you have a plan and purpose for their life, that they would hear your voice as you call them, Lord, to trust you. For those that have been walking with you a long time, I pray there'd be new encouragement that would come from, from your word and come from uh, just the reality of who you are, Jesus. Lord, we need you this morning, and, and we pray that, that we, would, we would see you and you would give us courage to respond to you. Lord, we pray all of this in your good, good name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So here at Real Life, we believe that Jesus Christ is God. We believe that he is co-equal with God the Father and co-equal with the Holy Spirit. We believe he was present at creation and that he participated in creation. We believe that at just the right time, he took on flesh and lived among us. We believe that Jesus called 12 guys to come follow him. He had the first small group, if you will. He called them disciples. He was their teacher, and, and they were his followers. And he was teaching them about uh, who God is and what God cares about and who God cares about. He demonstrated his power to them and, and to all the people that were around him by doing a, amazing, incredible things. He would heal people that were lame and heal people that had leprosy. He would feed people, you know, thousands of people with just a few ingredients. He um, even, even walked on water. And what he was doing is he was training these, these guys for ministry and getting them ready to plant the first church, if you will. Because he knew that he was going to die. He knew he was going to raise from the dead. He knew he was going to ascend to heaven one day. And that his spirit was going to come and, 
and, and live within as believers. <clears throat> In fact, the, the story that we're going to get into this morning, he had already told his disciples three times that he was going to um, be condemned to death, that he was going to be mocked, that he was going to be flogged, that he was going to be crucified but he was going to be raised to life on the third day. He told them three separate times, and it's interesting that they still didn't quite understand it because we know that because the third time that he told them that he was going to die and raised from the dead, they started arguing about, well, who gets the best position in his new kingdom? They didn't quite understand. They were confused by who Jesus was. Now, the people we're going to see in the story, God's... Uh, Uh, in, in Jerusalem, the, the Jews, they had a strong identity as God's chosen people. They knew that their father Abraham had been chosen by God to be the father of a nation. And they believed in their patriarchal uh, system where they knew the stories of father Abraham, they knew the stories of Isaac, they knew the stories of Jacob. They knew the stories of their great kings. They knew about King David who led them in battle, probably the greatest king of Israel, who led them in battle oftentimes uh, against forces that were much larger than their army. So they knew about kings. But they also grew up with stories of conquest and oppression. They knew the stories of foreign invaders that would come in and that, that sought to subjugate the Jewish people to their will. So they knew the story of the Babylonians that came and took over uh, the Jews in 539 B.C. They knew about the Persians. They knew about the Greeks. In fact, they knew about the Romans who recently took them over in 63 B.C., which they were living under the oppression and the rule of at the present time. Kind of helped set the stage for the story we're going to look at. See, the Jews were looking for a king. Because they had, they had had story after story that a king was coming, a messiah, a deliverer. But they, they, they had an expectation for their king. If you will, as they heard the stories, they kind of created a king. A king that would come with a sword. A king that would come in and do battle and, and, and conquest and, and destroy the Roman oppression that they were living under. Because they thought the biggest problem in their life was the Roman oppression and control. And, this is kind of, and they believed when that king came, he was going to reestablish them as God's chosen people. That's kind of where we enter the story today. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 21, if you'll start, uh, join with me, I'll be uh, reading out of the New, uh, New International Version. In 21.1 it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Ol Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied here, with her colt by, here, by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, which means please save the son of, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Verse 12, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. 
But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out to the city to Bethany where he spent the night. So there's, a, there's a, a lot of things going on in this story and sometimes hard for us to understand living in 2021 because we don't typically have people ride into our towns on donkeys, right? If we do, they definitely get our attention. So Jesus is making a declaration. Remember, the Jews are waiting for their king. They, they were told that a king was coming and Jesus is declaring that he's that king, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Savior. He is saying, I'm the one that you're waiting for I just look a little different than maybe what you're expecting. And here's an interesting thing. So what's happening in this, this, this uh, when he's riding in, he is coming in to Jerusalem as a king. And they would, uh, so think about this. If you have a king that would come in who had had a victory over another nation, he would ride into the city and he would oftentimes be dragging behind him the, the conquered king, the king that he conquered, maybe prisoners that he conquered, and they would, they would be celebrating who he is, and there would be this big parade. That's what is going on here. Now, they knew a king was coming because of the prophecy they, they had heard from the prophets, which we see written out in the Old Testament. Here's a problem with Old Testament prophecies that make it hard for us to understand sometimes is Old Testament prophecies often blend two events into one perspective. The two events that are divided by the New Testament, which we call the first advent of Jesus, or the first coming of Jesus, and the second advent of Jesus, or the second coming of Jesus. Right? And so they're separated by the church age that we live in right now. In the first advent of Jesus, Jesus presented himself humbly riding in on a donkey as a king who came to offer peace. Does this make sense to you? Right, so let me read some of the prophecies about Jesus. In Zechariah 9.9, it says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Some, some translations say righteous and having victory. He is humble, is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he comes in riding on that donkey as saying, this prophecy is being fulfilled in me right now. Okay, you with me? Listen to this, Isaiah. You've heard this passage at Christmas probably. For, uh, uh, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. Doesn't that sound awesome? Awesome? Real fairness and real justice? It says the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. So here's this idea that Jesus came the first time, right? Born of a virgin, born as a baby. He came into Jerusalem the first time, humbly on a colt, offering peace between man and God. With me so far. Okay? Guess what? He is going to rule one day. It's this idea of it's happened now, but not yet. He's established his kingdom in the heavenly realms. It says when we become Christians, we become citizens of heaven with Christ Jesus. This is why we sing those, some of those songs. He is our king, right? He is our king. We're his subjects. Now, a subject is to be devoted to a king. This is why this is important, right? A king has all authority over his subjects. Would you agree? So what we say when we become Christ followers is we say that Jesus Christ becomes our king. This is important for us because a king requires devotion. Now here's the cool thing about our king. He is good and he is fair and he is just. He is not like any human king you have ever seen. Right? So it's talking about this king in some of the, in some of the prophecies. Micah 5.2 But you, O Bethlehem, Ephratha, Ephratha, are only a small village among all the people of Ju Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, a king of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, who's always been, 
will come to you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last his fellow countrymen will return from exile to, lead their, uh, to their own land, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength and the majesty of the name of his Lord. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world. So here's this idea. This is who this king is. And his heavenly kingdom has been established. And Jesus came, and he's, we see him coming into Jerusalem to offer peace between man and God. But what was confusing to them is they're like, there's some of these prophecies that aren't fulfilled yet. Right? He hasn't established. I don't see him ruling in, in all fairness and all justice on earth. You, you see the, tr- the, the tension here? It's a tension we all live in. Like the Bible says that you and I, when we become followers of Jesus, that there's this fundamental radical change in our life. That we go from enemies of God to friend of God. We go from sinner to saint. And we know that's true. By faith we believe that. But sometimes that experience is tough for us to experience, isn't it? Some of you struggle with that this morning on the way to church. And the, maybe the way you answered the person sitting next to you in the car. Right? Maybe when you woke up this morning and looked in the mirror, you're like, man, I, I, know, I know what the Bible says about me, but it's hard to experience that sometimes. It's that reality that it's true of us, but man, the experience is sometimes not yet. So Psalm 45, 6 and 7, when talking about this king, it says, Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and you hate evil. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. So if they knew some of these prophecies, they're expecting he loves justice. He hates evil. Well, for us, we know Rome's evil. So we got to believe that he's coming in. He's coming on a stallion. He's coming with the sword. And we're going to notice that he's our king when he starts lopping off the head of all the Romans. Caesar, look out. Our king's coming. This is what they were looking for. This is what some of us are looking for, I think. So this is where I can really relate to these guys. Because for us, we have this idea of what our biggest problems are. Right? Our biggest problem uh, for many of us, we think, is what, what's going to happen to the economy or, 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 or who's got elected president or, or whatever those things. You, you pick your thing that you wring your hands about all the time. But we're going to see that Jesus is going to reveal that there's a bigger problem that we sometimes miss and we sometimes forget. Isaiah 11.1, 1, when talking about who Jesus is or who the coming king is going to be, this Messiah that they're waiting for, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. He will shake at the force of his word. The earth will shake at the force of his word and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. And as we go through this Passion Week, as you read through the gospel, you're going to see that these people that are just proclaiming, Hosanna, save us. They're celebrating the whole town. Is Who is this riding in on this donkey? The whole town is, 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 is brought you know, in an uproar over this entrance. And they, they seem to adore him. And then a week later, we hear those same people say, crucify him. And you're like, how did they get there? But don't we get there that way sometimes? Don't we have expectations of God? And he doesn't meet them the way he thinks that we think that he should. And so we start shaking our fist at him or, or we start becoming disinterested in God because he's not working the way we think he should. I think some of that, they're experiencing some of that. Like, we want our king to come in and restore our kingdom today. And he comes in on a donkey, offering peace. In fact, look at what his first action is. His first action isn't going to 
the palace and taking out Caesar, his first action is to go to the temple in Jerusalem and clear it. In fact, in Mark eleven fifteen, it says it this way. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. So what he's starting to show them is the, your biggest problem isn't, excuse me, Caesar, your biggest problem is your sin that separates you from God. In fact, not only are you separated from God in your sin, but you're keeping others from coming in and worshiping God also because your sins got in the way where you've set, they set up the temple to, as, a, as a moneymaker for them in the name of convenience. They wanted to make it easy to worship God. Hey, bring your animal, right? It's not a perfect animal. That's okay. We'll trade them for one that's acceptable. Hey, bring your money. We'll exchange your money. We want it to be as easy as possible for you to appease your conscience and be right before God. And he's saying, man, the problem's your hearts. It's not Caesar. And here's some, some cool things. This is my, my nerd brain for you. So when he comes in on the donkey, what Jesus is doing is by, by, by fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, he is saying, I am your king. By cleansing the temple, it's a fulfillment of Isaiah 56, 7, and 8. And, and it, it talks about what the coming king's going to do, that he is going to talk about the fa fact that the house of God is, is, is supposed to be a house of prayer. And Jesus is saying, I am that king. In fact, he's saying, not only am I a king over Israel, but I'm a king over all people, because Isaiah talks about that house being a house of prayer for all nations. And uh, by healing people in the temple, <clears throat> Isaiah 35 says that the coming king is going to heal people. And so Jesus is demonstrating that. Remember when the, 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 Roman, or the Jews became indignant because the children were, were worshiping Jesus. What Jesus is doing is, is quoting Psalm 8 and saying that he's receiving praise from the children. He is saying, I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I am, I am the Lord. I am the King. He's putting himself in that place. And here's the thing. I guess here's the thing that we have to understand, right? So what's that mean to me? Is that king came to offer peace. Peace with God. And, and I would say, because we have peace with God, we can have peace with one another as we follow God. You know, I love what John 3.16 says. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not... Uh, perish but have everlasting life right we forget sometimes that we're in everyone and that, uh, that implies that we need to be saved right right and so there's that 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 offer of having peace with god through christ jesus right i love the um I, I love the inclusion the inclusiveness of the gospel that everyone who believes will be saved but i love the exclusiveness of the gospel where jesus said i'm the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through me Right? Those are both true of Jesus. I love this in Luke chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus says, The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He's sitting in the synagogue. It says, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. I can only imagine how they were staring at him. And here's what Jesus says. The scripture you've just heard has been filled to this very day. He's saying, I am the one that, that God the Father has sent to proclaim freedom for the captives. I am the one who's come to proclaim that the Lord's favor is upon you right now. Right For everyone that says, well, Jesus never claimed to be Lord, I'm like, which part of the eight billion times in Scripture are you missing? Over and over again, he said it. 
And sometimes I think we don't want to believe that he's Lord because that means if he's Lord, if he's king, that means we have to bow our knee before him. And isn't that a challenge for us? Because we can't have two kings in our life. Right? We want to be king. We want to lead our life. We want to choose what's best for us. We want to choose um, which, which way is right. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to death. But we want to be that guy. We want to be self-governed. We want to be self-controlled. But the reality of Scripture says that we can't. Romans 3 says that there's nothing good that comes out of us in our flesh. Romans 3 says right, that we've been separated from God because of our sin, and that, that sin, uh, that, that separation lasts into eternity, and there's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right. We can't do it. It's because that sin nature we inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. But the Scripture says that God so loved the world that He sent His Son. Right? He left heaven and came to earth. He came on a rescue mission for us. And He comes to... to he, we're we're going to look next week where He goes on the cross and shed His blood for sin. Right? For the sin of humanity. For your sin and my sin. And His sin washes... Or His... I'm sorry. His blood washes our sin clean. Right? When it says that we're saved... Right, when we accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are saved, right, from, from past sin, from present sin, from that sin you're thinking about even right now, and from any sin you'll ever commit. You can't out sin the blood of Christ. Right? And then it says that we have new life when we come to Him because Jesus overcame sin and death. He overcame the biggest problem we'll ever have, our sin problem and that death problem. And so here's the reality. As followers of Jesus, when we leave this planet, and we will, no matter how many exercises or how, what you eat, you're going to die eventually. That will happen. But when you die, you will go to be with Jesus for eternity forever. And you will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And then you will live in a place where there's no death and no pain and no suffering. This is the reality of who we are. This is why we celebrate that coming king who comes in on a donkey because we know the rest of the story. Well, some of us know the rest of the story. Let's be honest. You know, the, the, to, to be saved in, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says it this simply. If you declare your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And that idea of faith, we've got to talk about that a second. Because I think, I, so I've got to be super careful here because I'm not a legalist. I'm not. But I also understand that we've created a culture, especially in America, that we think if we just say a prayer in a back row, right, that we get to live our life the way we want to live our life and Jesus just follows us around and does whatever we want him to do. But that's not true. See, there's an exchange that happens. This exchange of my sin for Jesus' life. This exchange of my brokenness for Jesus' wholeness. He, he, it says that he imputes his righteousness to us. We are declared righteous when we put our trust in Jesus. But also what happens is he becomes my king or my lord. And, and, and this is why it's important that I'm, I'm always loudly encouraging you to get into the word of God to learn who this king is. Because as you do, you'll discover that he's a good king. You'll discover that his heart for you is good and, it's, and he wants what's best for you. And really, what's best for us, and it sounds so weird in 2021, what's best for us is that we submit our will to his. What's best for us is that we serve him. What's best for us is that we don't live our lives thinking about how amazing everything is for me, but we live our lives actually wondering how can I be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world to serve other people. It seems countercultural. It is countercultural. But that's the kingdom of heaven. And here's why this is all important. Because the first time Jesus presented himself at the first advent as a humble king on a donkey, but the next time he's going to present himself as a conquering king on a stallion who's coming, right, the first time he came to offer peace. 
But the second time, he's coming to wage war against evil and to wage war against all of those who have set themselves up against him. I want to finish by reading Revelation 19, verse 11. This is John speaking, and he's talking about this king. It says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in white, fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is our King. This is our King. So, so I guess my invitation to you, maybe my challenge to you, is to choose today. Choose today. Choose to turn away from your self-ruled life. Choose to turn away from the life that leads to brokenness and leads to eternal separation from God. And choose today to bow your knee before this King. Bow your knee before this King who came riding on a donkey. Bow bow your knee to this King who came to serve. Right? The Scripture says He didn't come to to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Bow your knee to this king who, as he shed his blood, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This king that death could not hold. This king that that, that the the Father God was satisfied with the payment for sin. This king who rose from the dead on the third day. This king who sits at the right hand of the Father today and makes intercession for us, prays for his his saints, prays for the church. This king who one day is coming back in fury. This king who's coming back on a stallion with a a sword to make everything right, to take the abuse and the suffering and the disease and all of those things that break our hearts today, to, to put them to put them away and and, and, and to conquer them and to set up his, his, his perfect rule that will be fair and be just, where we'll experience no pain and no suffering. Bow your knee to this king and say yes to Jesus. And I, I, I just have to tell you, I tell you this over and over again, you will never, ever regret saying yes to Jesus. Whether it's the first time or the 10,000th time, you'll never regret it because he's good and you can trust him. So here's what we're going to do. Um, two things. I'm just going to invite you. Today is that day you could repent of your sins, turn away from that life, and turn towards Christ to trust Him. We do that in the quietness of our heart. A simple prayer. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me? Lord Jesus, I want to follow you as King. I want to follow you as Lord. Would you give me your spirit and, and help me to trust you, Lord? And then there's steps that follow. We talk about, right? Because as we're saved, as that life is changed, there's evidences of that life. That's why he invites us to be baptized. Things start changing. We leave that, the, the marks of the sinful life behind and we start learning to walk in righteousness. Here's the other thing, though. With our king, you and I become his hands and feet. So who this week can you share the simple story of the gospel of Jesus with? I have to tell you, we live in a world that people are hopeless. It just seems like it's bad news after bad news after bad news. And the goodness of the good news of the gospel changes lives to know that there's a God in heaven who loves you regardless of where you've been or what you've done regardless of what your mom said about you or your dad said about you or that employer said about you to know there's a God in heaven who loves you 
And he loves you enough that he sent his son to die for you, who's living for you and wants to give you abundant life. It changes everything. Who can you tell that story to? We're going to take a moment. I'm going to invite you to, to pray. Just spend some time talking to Jesus in response to the word this morning. The servers are going to start getting the elements of communion ready. If you're new with us here at Real Life, we celebrate communion together every week at every service. And if you're a follower of Jesus, we look at you as family and we kind of look at this time as the family meal, family celebration. And what we're doing is that they pass out those elements, you'll find two cups and in the lower cup is a piece of bread and the upper cup is some grape juice. The bread represents the body of Jesus that was given at the cross. The blood represents the blood of, or the cup, the uh, juice represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And so when we take them, we're celebrating the fact that our sin was paid for. We're acknowledging the high price that was paid for our sin, the body and blood of Christ. But we're also acknowledging that Jesus came. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He died. And on the third day, he rose from the dead and he sits at the right hand of the Father. We're making that proclamation and he'll come back one day to make things right. So as they pass out the elements, I'm going to invite you to take a moment and pray. I'd like to give you a couple things to pray through. First, as you pray, ask Jesus if, uh, just take some time and confess any of that sin that's in the way of the intimacy you can enjoy with him. 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I just invite you to pray. Confess those things. Ask Jesus to forgive you and by the power of his spirit that you would walk in his righteousness this week. I invite you to pray for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I like to use my sanctified imagination and picture their face as I pray for them. pray for people who are struggling this morning. There's a lot of hurt in the world. There's a lot of fear in the world. Show God how he might use you to minister to the people you're praying for. Finally, we, we pray for Jesus' church. We pray for this church that we will stay committed to the mission Jesus has called us to, of following Jesus, being conformed to his image. Calling others to follow Jesus also. But then we also pray for the other churches here in the Silver Valley. Pray for them by name. Pray for their pastors, if you know them, and their, their congregations. Pray for the church as a whole around the world. First Corinthians 11, Paul writes, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take this bread and remember the body of Christ. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. 
love how he finishes this passage. But whenever you drink this bread or eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming back. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. We thank you, Father God, for sending your son Jesus. We thank you for the mission that he came on to rescue us and to give us life. Lord, I pray for each person that's here, that they would see you, Jesus, as you really are. And I pray for the church as a whole around the world that we would come back to, to the, the, the simplicity of the gospel, the power of the gospel, that we would learn not only, God, to preach the gospel to ourselves constantly, to be reminded that we are saved by Jesus, but to share it with our friends, to share it with, with anyone that we come in contact with in word and deed. Lord, you are so good to us. And we thank you, Jesus, for, for being our king. We pray all of this in your good name. Amen. We'd love it if you'd stand with us and sing this song. This is one of the newer songs we've been singing in this, as a church. And I just got to tell you, there's so much power in this song. So we join, ask you, if you'd like to pray, we'd love it if you'd come up and pray with us this morning. The Lord bless you.
prayer for our church this week is as we dive into those gospels and we just dive into the heart of Jesus that you will see his great love for you. God so loved the world, God so loved you that he sent his one and only son that if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will, you will experience eternal life. Your sins will be washed clean. You will experience that abundant life that Jesus has for you. You will experience, you will, you will experience the life that God created you for as you walk with him. Not perfectly here on earth. But man, we get those tastes, don't we? We get those views, don't we? And then one day when we leave the planet, we will spend eternity, we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's my hope for you, that we'll learn to finish well together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Jesus, we are, we are grateful. We are grateful that you came. We are grateful. Lord Jesus, that you died. We are grateful that you rose from the dead. And I pray that each person here today, God, and those that are listening online, that they would see your heart for them. That they would bow their knee to you because it's what's best for them, God. They will learn that we will learn to follow you as king. We will learn to trust what your word says about, about you and about the world and about who we are. And that by your Holy Spirit, you will empower us to be exactly who you say we are, God. We love you. We, 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 we give you all praise this morning. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, give someone a, a holy fist bump this morning. Okay? I love you, church. God bless you. Have you ever met those who keep humming when the song's through? It's like they're living life to a whole different tune. And have you ever met those that keep hoping when it's all blends? It's like.